can I start right now? Oh, okay. Uh, welcome to the uh, to the small talk uh, about the uh, romantic piano music. Okay, I will try my best to make it a uh, as interesting as possible. Okay. Well, actually, you know, once when the uh, music history enters into the uh, uh, romantic era, then it is a very, very hum, hum, you know, very human related era, and it is one of the most colorful and most attractive music uh, era in the whole of music history. Okay, so as we all know, you know, uh, for every music period there is one important instrument associated with that particular historic period. If we are talking about Renaissance, then we say, okay, uh, it is always about the lute, okay? And when we talk about bar Baroque, then we always talk about, you know, it is related to the harpsichord, okay? All right, so when uh, the classic uh, classical period comes, that means, you know, uh, you know Mozart, Haydn, okay? and early Beethoven, and they have, you know, the primitive piano, so-called forte piano, okay? It is at the very beginning of the, uh, of the uh, instrument, okay? However, during the Romantic period, uh, because of the uh, industry revolution and because of the technology and because of the science, so the piano comes to its being, okay? Like this. And then when we arrived at around 1840 to 1860, okay, the piano has reached its final form, like this. And after that, for more than, you know, almost to this day, almost, you know, 100, you know, 60 years later, or almost 200 years later, it doesn't change much, okay? So, uh, the first thing about the uh, romantic piano music we have to talk about is the piano itself. Okay, uh, during that period of time, uh, you know, uh, when Beethoven comes along, you know, everybody knows Beethoven is a great composer, but actually before he lost his hearing, he is the greatest pianist in Europe at that time. Okay, uh, if it is not because of his year, he might not be such a great composer, but he will always be a great pianist, okay? So during his life, the piano keeps glowing. You know, at first you have, you know, five and a half octaves, you know, not that many keys, and then later on you have six, uh, six octaves, and then six, six and a half octaves, and then even more. Finally, they decided that, you know, enough is enough because your hand cannot stretch, so while, then we fix it, it is 88 keys, okay, like this. So all this has been fixed during that period of time, at the early period of 19th century, and then when it reaches the middle of eight, uh, 19th century, the piano is settled down, it is like this. So because of this, and because of the development of technology of building such a instrument, then, you know, the range of the keys, and then the sound, and then the color, and then the tone, and then with the pedal, the sustained pedal, everything will make this instrument to be very powerful and has all the means of expression, okay? It is, you know, the lowest note of the piano is lower than the lowest note of the orchestra. The highest note of the piano is higher than the highest uh, instrument that you can play, whatever instrument it is, okay? And unlike those melodic uh, instruments like violin, clarinet, uh, oboe, uh, you, you can play many voices with the piano. That means you can you know, always play the accompaniment and the melody, everything at the same time. Okay, so by itself, it is very powerful once it has reached its final form. So this is very important. Plus, because of the building of the uh, piano, it becomes more and more powerful. That means the dynamic range of the piano 
the softest sound and the loudest sound of the piano is so wide, you know, uh, you, you can, you know, uh, fill the whole hall with only one piano, all the great sounds, okay? Unlike if you are playing a harpsichord or one single violin, sooner or later, you know, if you sit at the very back of the big hall, somebody cannot hear it, okay? All right, so this is a very important, you know, historic achievement, actually, for musicians and for Western music as well, okay? Now, what had happened to the, to the instrument? Because before the industry revolution, every instrument, if you can think of it, okay, most of it are made of wood, okay? And if it is the string, then it is the gut string. It is not the steel string. And only if you have the trumpets or the horns, trom trombones, that you have some metals in it. Even fruit were first made in wood. Okay? So by the time when we reach the 19th century, the piano has steels in it. All the strings are steel. So because they are steel, then it becomes very powerful, the resonance and the vibration, okay? Now, however, uh, they put more than one string for one note. For the higher register of the notes, you will have three strings for one single note, okay? That means it becomes extremely powerful. And because you mounted so many strings, more than, you know, at least uh, more than 200 strings, all steels on it. Then if you hold those strings with pins and, you know, plant those metal pins into the wood, it doesn't work because the whole wood is going to bend and change its shape. So they use iron, okay, use iron to use iron and make the metal flim for the strings to mount it on over there. And then for some of the lower strings, not only will they have the steels in it, they also have brass or bronze, uh, uh, bra uh, bronze, 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 okay? So you, ha you, ha you will have metal for the frame, for the steel, for the strings, and the bronze, for the strings as well, okay? Uh, not only do you have the metals, but also you will have the fail, you have the wood, you have uh, all the letters, okay? And you know, before these days, they even have the, uh, uh, you know, the, the key, when, when you play on the key. Uh, right now we have the white color and the, and the black color, okay? They use elephant teeth at the very beginning, okay, because they don't have such uh, material, okay, at the beginning. So all the high techs put into the, the material, put into the piano, and then they mix them together in a scientific way in order to build this wonderful instrument, okay? Uh, so uh, if you are interested uh, enough, you know, after the talk, uh, maybe you can come closer to the piano and, and then I can point out some of the things for you. Not only that, okay, mm, now, uh, the mechanical part of the uh, uh, key, okay, so if you press down a key, then, you know, you know when the key is down, the hammer strikes on the strings, okay, however, the hammer won't stay on the string. So you won't stop the vibration of the spring, of the string, okay? So the resonance can come out, okay? So all those uh, very delicate and very high-tech during that time, uh, the so-called escape movement of the key, okay? And later on, they even develop double escape movement for the keys, okay? Once they have the escape movement, that means you can play the same note very fast, okay? And then also you can play this passage very fast as well. Not only that, 
they also put in the pedal in it. Because once you press the key, the hammer strikes the string, and the, the damper raises itself. So it is not going to dim the string, let the uh, string vibrate. However, you release your finger, the damper comes down and stop the vibration of the spring. However, if you, you put down the pedal and you know how to use the pedal, then you can use you can you can you can create you know you know uh, endless color of tone. Okay, it becomes very very uh, powerful with the pedal. Okay, not only do you have the sustain pedal, but you also have the uh, window coda, so called the soft pedal. Once you step on the soft pedal, then it kind of comes softer. Okay, so every different kinds of tricks or technologies, the highest tenor technologies during that period of time are put into this wonderful instrument. Okay, all right. And during that period, that particular period of time, this one piece of machine, or you can call it machine if you want to, is the most complicated machine. Okay. And it is one single uh, machine which has the most parts in it, 8,000 parts, different parts. If you take it to, you know, apart, you will count 8,000. During that period of time, you won't have another machine that you, you, you need uh, 8,000 individual parts to put it together to work. Okay? So this is the instrument. All right, once the instrument becomes to evolve, and becomes de develop, so will the human, the pianist that we handle the instrument starts to you know to develop. Okay, so first of all, the philosophy of how to play the instrument starts to change. Uh, the new oral experience. The sound that we hear becomes, you know, different from the past. Okay, and once you need to handle such a important or powerful instrument, then the demand on the physical body, uh, inclu including your arms, fingers, uh, wrists, forearms, and obviously your body, your 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 legs, everything is different. Okay, uh, therefore, new ways of playing the piano starts to appear. Okay, okay. So everything because uh, of the uh, uh, development of the technology, the way to play, the way that we demand on our own body becomes different. Okay, now so from that point onwards, if you want to perform, and if you want to play in public, then you need, started to need professionals, okay? Those two professionals at the beginning uh, of that period of time, they invent new music, invent new technique, invent new ways of handling the instrument, okay? And because it is a invention process, so each Composer and each pianist invent their own way of playing through their music. So right now, after you know, uh, 150 years or almost 200 years later, then you know it's much easier for us to handle different people's technique and different people's piano music. But at that time, each pianist are unique and only for his own invention and own ability of playing, okay? So at that time, the pianist and the composers are combined in one oneness, okay? So those people who wrote those piano music, they can play themselves, okay? Some of the pieces are so uh, you know, unique and so forward-looking and so challenging, only they can play. Others cannot play at the very beginning of it. Okay, so you know these kind of things are really making the whole 
historic period of time during that, that time, you know, very interesting. Uh, okay, now, therefore, the pianists at that period of time becomes heroes. They become showmen, okay? They can sell tickets and they can be the boss of themselves, okay? They can make a living by playing the instrument in front of the public. You buy the ticket and you go into the concert hall and then you worship your hero, all right? It's like pop star, like, like you know, these days uh, during that period of time. So they were considered heroes, they were considered masters, they are considered saviors, okay? They are on top of the world. Okay, later on, we, I'm going to explain why, okay? Now, after we talk about the instrument and we talk about the pianist and the pianist composer, then we talk about the music, the early romantic piano music. First of all, it is very humanistic. That means very close to human, okay? Uh, it has lots of personal feeling. At that time, all the pianists and the composers and the musicians, they are not trying to please the ears of the audience. You can no longer uh, listen to the music and then you no longer you know, eat, uh, eat your dinner okay, or talk to somebody else or dance. No, you sit still and you listen to me. <laughs> okay? uh, and I am the God, I speak to you. Okay? At that time, it is this relationship. Okay, so uh, therefore, when they make their statements, those statements must be very personal. Okay, it has to communicate. Also, it has to impress you. All right, and since everybody has his own personality, as an artist and as a pianist, they have their own way of playing it. Therefore, uh, the musical language they have uh, to pass through and the message they want to uh, let the audience to receive are very different from composers to composers. So in the Romantic period, then everybody must be different. You have to be your own, okay? Not trying to copy somebody else's. In the previous you know, era, it is completely this, the opposite, okay? So when we talk about Haydn, Mozart, Beethoven in the classics, you know, their model is modeled on the Greek. Okay? During that period time, of time, they believe in Greek philosophy. That is, everything there is a perfect mo model. If we all do it right, by the end of the day, everything we write or everything we, we sing, everything we play, it will be the same. Okay? Uh, in the Romantic, it has to be different, one from the others. Okay. okay, and another very important thing is, in this period of time, the music is started to integrate it with other art form as well. So, it has to relate it to poetry, it has to relate it to literature, it has to relate it to painting, sculpture, architecture, historic events, okay, everything. Uh, in so doing, that means the music becomes programmatic, okay? So you cannot imagine otherwise, okay, if the, Im the intention of the composer is this. Okay? You cannot say, you know, I listen to this music, uh, then, you know, I think of some somebody, uh, something else. No, the composer write this and he is telling you this feeling, this impression, this image, or this story. That's it, okay? Okay, that, that's very, uh, you know, very different from the previous historic period. Uh, so the music becomes very programmatic, and then sometimes you will have very clear image, and then it becomes, the music becomes very lively, okay? And sometimes uh, all the music has a very clear purpose. Okay, all right. <clears throat> now. Uh, therefore, at this period of time, we have uh, some perfect matches. That means the mind and the fingers must match. 
okay? Music and technique must match. And instrument and pianist must match. They must uh, integrate into each other, okay? And the showman, the showman and the audience, they must integrate as well, okay? Therefore, the pianist is trying to show and then the audience is trying to be impressed because I pay ticket. So when I go into the theory, uh, I mean the theater, uh, I, I better be impressed, uh, otherwise I won't pay for it, okay? All right? Uh, therefore, you know, uh, this is the very uh, significant historic part of the period, okay? Now, how about the audience? Now, the audience at this stage is also very, very different from the previous historic era. Because if you read the history, then you will notice, you know, ever since the late 18th century and into the 19th century, it is very turbulent historic period of time in Europe. Okay, many wars, many things happened. Okay, science starts to take root the church were being accused. So people used to go to find their comforts in the church. They started to doubt. In the past, they listened to their dukes, their kings, their emperors. Right now, they think, I am also equals to you. So in that case, everybody starts to look for something to spiritually speaking, to fulfill their needs. What? Okay, in the past, it is always God, and then the church, and then the rulers telling you what to do, what to believe, what to feel, and how to act, or even how to live. Right now, they lost, you know, because they no longer believe in the priests or the bishops or the rulers, okay, they turn to art. Therefore, when they listen to music, some of them obviously try to go to these kind of things for go to these kind of concerts for spiritual fulfillment, okay, to be uh, purified. But obviously, for some other audience, when they go into the concert hall or listen to the pianist to perform, they want to see, you know, very difficult passage, uh, very, very, uh, uh, you know, challenging passage, uh, like doing magics, okay, uh, all these kind of things. So the audience really has done a large part to force the instrument to develop and also force the pianist and the composer to change as well, okay? So, uh, <clears throat> therefore, then we come to the uh, great composers, okay? So we talk about the instrument a little bit, we talk about the uh, uh, pianist and composer in general a little bit, okay? And then, <clears throat> finally, we are going to talk about the uh, romantic uh, pianist, and romantic composers. Very lucky, <coughs> actually, you know, because um, there is uh, there is a whole generations of uh, pianists being burned at the same year or around the same year. Okay. Uh, please remember the magic year is 1810, okay? Why? Uh, Chopin is burned in uh, 1810, uh, Liszt is 1811, Schumann is 1809, Mendelssohn 1810. Uh, so you, you, you see, all those great ones uh, all were burned uh, at that period of time. So when they reach uh, their maturity, you know, in a very early age, that means in the 1830s and 1840s, they started to have 
all those masterpieces coming out of it. Okay? Today, I am only going to concentrate on only three composers. Okay, because you know, in my concert program, I'm going to play uh, the uh, Chopin, uh, and then uh, the Liszt, and then Brahms. Okay, so we are going to concentrate on those three masters. So the first one, we are going to talk about Chopin. Okay, uh, I'm going to talk a little bit, and then I will demonstrate a little bit. Okay, and then I'm going to t talk about the next composer and play a little bit. Okay. Uh, it might not be very easy for me to do this, uh, changing the role. I might make some mistakes, but uh, you know, uh, I hope that's understandable. Okay. So for Chopin, this is the most, in most original composers, both in piano music and also in piano technique. Basically, if you check his background, he studied a little bit in the Warsaw. Warsaw, Warsaw uh, Conservatory over there, okay? However, he did, didn't follow any famous teacher. And then he basically in, invent his own technique on the piano, okay? So Chopin improvised on the piano, and then while he is playing the piano, he started to make up his own technique, which fits only his own hand, okay? Because he didn't come from any traditional schools like uh, the German school, the Austrian school, okay, or the French school. Everything he comes out and writes for the piano is original. It's groundbreaking, okay? Okay, this is for one. The second one is, you know, his music is always if you listen to it, it is like improvise, always making up, okay? And then uh, his improvise is so delicate, and then he's aiming at the perfection of the piano music. All his piano music are full of details, tiny little changes, that if you do not pay attention to it, you cannot handle it, okay? Uh, <clears throat> besides this, he is always not trying to show off his technique. He is always aimed at the highest uh, uh, artistic standard. Therefore, he is also aiming at a perfect so-called balance. That means in his piano music, you will have technique. You will have lyrical lines. You will have structure. You will have musical forms, okay? You will have polyphonic. You will have harmony. You will have everything. And then every time, actually in his piano music, there are lots of similar sections, okay? And all these similar sections are never exactly the same. So therefore, if you uh, try to uh, you know, overlook all the, those details, and if you try to strike for one element of his piano music, then you lost everything else. So actually, Chopin is the most difficult composer to handle. For every pianist, they can play some of the composers, and they can sometimes avoid playing the other composers. However, for a pianist, only one composer, pianist, that they cannot avoid is Chopin. You have to play Chopin, okay? You don't need to play Liszt if you don't like him, okay? If you don't like uh, Beethoven, like Chopin hates Beethoven, he don't play Beethoven, he play Mozart, doesn't matter, okay? You can play Mozart, you can play Schubert, you can play Schumann, you don't need to play Schumann, you don't need to play Schubert, but you have to play. Chopin, everybody, okay? Because it is so balanced. Within his music, there's so many things in it, okay? And it is so delicate, okay? Uh, uh, therefore, uh, uh, I will play a little bit, okay? And try to demonstrate, 
So for instance, uh, some, of the, uh, some of the pieces, okay, uh, so-called uh, the uh, 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 etude, so-called the study. That means I move my fingers. <laughs> Okay, stress. Okay, then you run. Okay, then you put, you you play your fingers. However, uh, if you really look into all his studies, it is not uh, an exercise for the fingers. Okay, unlike Kenny's uh, studies. Okay, uh, for those etudes or those studies you are preparing your fingers to play some master work. For Chopin, those etudes are master work itself. Nobody dares to play, you know, in front of you. No, okay? Why? Because there are so many lines and so many harmonies in it, okay? Okay, so once you started to uh, handle the keyboard. So it is it's no longer it's no longer finger exercise anymore. Alright? And then sometimes even you know exact uh, repetition of the same musical phrase. And if you are willing to spend time and if you are uh, willing to uh, you know dig into the uh, very root of it, then you will find out all the interesting lines and melodies that nobody else has seen or before. So for all his pieces, uh, there are so many different ways of playing it, okay? So for instance... <laughs> this passage appears three times, okay? But my teacher, Sekela Costa, teaches me, okay, you play every time different. You go home, find out what is in it. So if you play
box part. Every time it's different. But if you look at the score, every time the notes are the same. OK? So this is the greatness of Chopin. All right? Uh, obviously, Chopin can also you know, uh, write so many nice nocturnes. And even in his uh, studies, there's very, very nice nocturnes. Uh, uh, <coughs> The, 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 the attitude becomes like this, then it's no longer training your fingers, but actually training your ears, okay? Your pedal, and then handling of different voices. Okay, so this is a little bit about Chopin. <coughs> oh, always remember, perfect balance. Uh, enormous uh, detail. Very, very uh, delicate. And all the pieces that he wrote are masterpieces. Unlike uh, at least, least write 8,000 pieces, maybe you know only 50 are the great ones. All the others are rubbish, OK? Japan, everything he wrote is masterpiece. Because he requires himself so high. Everything that he doesn't like or he doesn't think he lives up to the standard of the art, then he just burn it. Okay, before he die, he look, uh, he must ask uh, his sister to burn all the uh, manuscript in front, of him, in, in front of him before he die. Okay, so uh, that's Chopin. Okay, <coughs> now the next one, uh, I would like to go to, uh, oh, let's go to uh, 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 Brahms first. Okay, <coughs> Brahms. <coughs> Brahms uh, is the representative of the so-called uh, the most powerful and most authoritative schools. That's German Austria school. Okay, so everything from that school is the great ones. Oh. Uh, however, um, you know when we talk about German schools, seldom did they have you know very uh, attractive uh, singing lines. Okay. However, uh, they have powerful uh, and very skillful handling of the structure, very complicated structures, and very many layers of uh, music going on at the same time. Sometimes they even make the, uh, 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 the harmony, the tonality, and everything so, 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 uh, so, challenging actually. Obviously Brahms is younger, about you know, 20 years younger than uh, both Chopin and Liszt, okay? Uh, therefore, in his uh, composition, uh, pianistically speaking, it is very awkward, not fit to your hand, okay? Uh, it, it has his own kinds of technique, requirement. And also, he, unlike the Chopin, 
the lyrical or the singing lines, and most of them very uh, evenly distributed in the middle part of the of the keyboard range. Brahms goes to the deep bass, okay, very deep ones. Uh, <coughs> the interesting of it, it is the ambiguity of the tonality. Sometimes the tonality is not very clear. So a while ago when we played the Chopin, you know, you can clearly sense uh, what kind of color, what kind of key is in, okay? But for Brahms, it keeps changing, uh, for one thing. The second thing is there's so many different elements in so short of a musical passage. What does that mean? You know, a while ago I just demonstrated some of the Chopin passage. Basically, you can see it's the same texture. It is the same atmosphere. Okay. However, in Brahms, you will see keep changing the color and keep changing the musical elements in it and keep changing the keys. Okay. Uh, those are very, uh, very, very, uh, very interesting things for Brahms. Um, also, you know, some of the hand positions and some of the techniques of Brahms music is uh, very strange, uh, peculiar, uh, very, uh, very, uh, you know, uh, very odd, actually, very unnatural, actually. So when you play Brahms, you better uh, be very mature, and then you have to have a, a solid technique, and you have to have strong fingers, and sometimes you have to have your mind to help, uh, you know, unlike Chopin or Liszt, uh, their pieces are so difficult, but at the same time, it's so fit to your hand. Okay, so natural. Uh, Brahms is not. Okay, uh, and another thing is the uh, rhythmic. Okay, the rhythm, uh, the beats, are very strange as well. Sometimes they keep sh shifting the accents of the uh, of the phrase, okay? Uh, if you listen to Liszt or if you listen to uh, Brahms, then you don't encounter such a problem, all right? Uh, I play a little bit, okay, and then, uh, uh, and then I, I tell you why. develop, nor go anywhere. Another one. Immediately, another one. Best 
melody. Uh, he can write. And Greek still it. Okay. And then immediately you change to another one. talking I keep making mistakes <laughs> all right so I can only play or or or, or, or talk So many different techniques and so many layers, so many different musical ideas. And so some of them are very contrasting to each other. Um, some of the uh, passage, you can see it is not very uh, uh, fit to the hands, okay? Uh, you have to uh, concentrate, otherwise you are going to make mistakes, okay? Uh, Sometimes, you know, some, some of the writings are, are very strange. Melodies of back and forth, okay? Is sometimes it's in the right hand, sometimes you cross hand it is in the left. Okay? So if you do not see the lines and if you cannot handle the structure, then it becomes you know you lost. And obviously your audience also lost. Okay. 
All right, uh, the last, uh, I'm going to talk a little bit about LIST. Uh, uh, LIST uh, is the, uh, you know, during his period of time, he is the biggest showman in his age. He is the Michael Jackson during the uh, 1840s and 1845 or 46. Okay, uh, after uh, 1845 or so, he no longer gives uh, recitals or concerts anymore. At least uh, only pay for charities and never pay play for money anymore. Okay, because he's filthy rich and very famous. Okay, he don't need money. He goes to a town and then he shows his name card. All the nobles just give them, you know, whatever he wants. Okay, all right, uh, including the uh, the pop, uh, the bishop, everybody. <coughs> uh, for least, it is much different. Okay, why? Because in his music, there's lots of notes, very difficult to play. In one way, however, on the other, you know, it becomes, uh, uh, you know, all those things are so fit to the hands. Uh, sometimes if you live up to the technique and if your ability is de developed to that level, then you will see, you know, it becomes so natural. Uh, and then you addict it to his music all the way to play. Okay, every time when you run through his piece, you feel excited and you feel carried away, and that's very bad, okay, actually, uh, because you have to always be uh, a master of yourself and always handle those things. Uh, the second thing is, you know, uh, he uh, likes to draw lots of variety of sonorities and, and, and sound effects from the piano, okay? Uh, and then whole pages after pages of music, actually there's very little substance. Uh, they used to say, you know, uh, this is always used a very, uh, very serious tone and very serious attitude to speak to you, okay? And immediately you, you uh, were caught by, by him, okay? However, after you, you, you finish the evening, then you remember, you know, what really uh, has he said, uh, then you will find out there's not much, <laughs> okay, <laughs> that's least. Uh, however, you know, but uh, the piece that I'm going to play uh, in my program is the uh, Dante Sonata. That means uh, the whole sonata is about, uh, after he uh, read the Dante, uh, comedy, okay, Infer uh, Inferno comedy, okay, and then uh, he wrote the piece. It is talking about the uh, the, the the hell, okay. Uh, so therefore, he tries to draw the the worst or the most dissonant uh, sound, piano sound, from the keyboard, okay. And then there's lots of difficult passage. If you do not have that kind of uh, technique, and if you cannot live up to the ch challenge, uh, then you know it is a struggle to get through the notes. However, if you uh, can live up to that level, then you know some of them you know become so 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 natural, so easy. So it is difficult, but at the same time it is easy. Okay, so natural. Uh, I just play a little bit for you, okay, because I am not concentrating. Okay. The most most dissonant sound that in Western music that you can hear. Again. Trying to resolve. Okay, you think it's 
finished? No. Okay. We saw. No. So on uh, on paper you will see lots of notes, and then you know from the very soft to the very loud, you have everything. Okay. However, uh, the musical substance is actually quite limited. Okay. And then uh, uh, I have to remember. piano and the effects are very easy to make actually. Okay. Uh, I think uh, my speech or my little talk would be, uh, I, I will finish at this, this point. However, I'm willing to uh, answer any questions that you have. Okay. Anyone care to answer anything? No, uh, <laughs> sorry, I'm here. Uh, I, I know you for a long, long time. Uh, you uh, sorry, I, I know you from a long, long time, and you have presented the piano, the technique, the, the music, and the composers. And uh, I want to know uh, something more about yourself. How, how do you start? Uh, I know that I, 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 I also know your, your father, uh, and you mentioned one of the biggest uh, Portuguese pianists that are uh, your teacher, the Scheda Costa. So that, can you talk a little bit about you and uh, go a, a little more intimate with us? Because we are your public uh, now. Uh, actually, uh, there's not much that I can talk about myself uh, as a kid. Uh, obviously, I hate piano, uh, and I don't like practice, okay? However, because my parents are both uh, pianists, and they were trained in China, and they graduated from the Central Conservatory of Music, the highest institute in China, uh, in 1950s, okay? So at a very early age, uh, my father, you know, forced me to play the piano. Actually, I don't like it at all, okay? And uh, after I go to uh, uh, high school, then you know my father and my mother cannot handle me anymore. Uh, my mother just uh, took me to Central Conservatory of Music in Beijing at that time and asked their teachers to fix me, okay? So <laughs> they fixed me good, okay? And then I sit still and then started to practice, but I never want to learn piano as my profession. And then uh, 
uh, when I graduated from the high school. Uh, before I graduated from the high school, the last three years uh, that I studied in the high school, uh, I was enrolled in uh, Sing Bihu, the 10th Aca Aca Academia of Music uh, study uh, organized by Father Ario. Okay, during that time, Father Ario uh, never uh, really taught me because he's too old and always get drunk, okay? But <laughs> oh, I don't know, okay. Where, where he is himself, okay. And then, uh, but uh, he got connections. Uh, once a while, you know, we have concerts in Macau, and all those overseas pianists come to Macau. Uh, uh, he asked them to listen to me. And then uh, I think uh, it is, uh, uh, I think in senior high school, the first year of senior high school, uh, Costa comes to Macau. Okay, and then he's a good friend of Father Ario, and Father Ario asked me to uh, pr you, you pray for, for, for Costa at that time. So I pray for Costa, and Costa give me lessons, okay? And then uh, every year from that point onwards, uh, he uh, tours uh, Asia yearly. Every time he comes to Macau, and then I pray for him, okay? And then he give, gives me lessons, okay? And then... Uh, and then uh, I was uh, graduated from the high school. Then I go to Hong Kong and enter those examinations. Uh, and uh, I was, uh, n I didn't know if I, I will be accepted uh, into the uh, uh, university in Hong Kong, the Chinese, Hong Kong Chinese University. At that time, there's only, there are only two universities in Hong Kong. One is Hong Kong U and the other one is Hong Kong Chinese U. Okay, all the others uh, uh, you know, didn't match up. So we, we go to the uh, uh, entrance exam, and I don't know whether I'm going to be accepted or not. Uh, and then Costa wrote me a letter that during that period of time and say, you know, do you want to study with me? I say, okay, why not? <laughs> I don't know whether I will be <laughs> accepted uh, by the Hong Kong Chinese University. Okay, so uh, I say yes, and then he said, okay, I asked my, uh, he's going to ask his assistant to do all the application, all the uh, visa, everything, and make me uh, to go over there to study with him. Uh, 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 yes, he's afraid that I might not get the visa, or the student visa, and then he gives uh, me the uh, exchange scholar visa. <laughs> so the uh, U.S. Embassy in Hong Kong must let me go to, 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 uh, to, to the States. Then once I, 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 I promise to go over there, and then uh, the result of the Hong Kong Chinese University comes out, I was accepted by them as well uh, <laughs> to study physics. Because that's my, I, I want to be an engineer or some, something like this. But my father said, you go, okay? <laughs> so so uh, then I make a deal with my father. Uh, if I'm not happy in the States, after one year, I'm going to run back, okay? And then he said, okay, you go. Then after one year, I never come back again. <laughs> For the next 13 years or so, I, I work intensively with uh, my master, okay, who has passed away two years ago, actually. And uh, uh, I'm very, very, very fortunate, okay. And uh, uh, in the university, uh, uh, um, you know, uh, study never uh, is a problem for me. So sometimes I have nothing to do wandering around after practice, then another fear is in the university, uh, the professor Shenwei saw me and then he said, you have too much time, you study another subject, <laughs> music theory. <laughs> so I work music theory as well. So, uh, uh, you know, before I come back, I got all my degrees, five of them together. <laughs> so here I am, okay, uh, that's it. So that's thank you very <laughs> much. I think it, I think that it's a privilege for Macau to 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 can to have this recital and to have uh, Professor uh, Leung uh, with us. And uh, oh. for us now here in the Fundação, it's also a big big privilege because the two recitals are all sold out. 
So I, eh? In one minute. So that uh, it's a good, good privilege. So thank you very much. No, no, no. Uh, oh, yes. I, over here, I want to say a few words. I never intended to give any more recitals. Because after I come back to Macau, I give quite a few recitals almost yearly. Uh, and then I get into the uh, administrative work. Uh, and then almost for 20 years, I didn't, I, I didn't practice uh, seriously or systematically. And I never give uh, any recitals again. And then it is my friend. I might I It's my friend, OK? Uh, the president of the uh, Piano Association of Macau, uh, with his arrangement, actually, we are talking about to arrange a recital, right? For my student, and then for my student, okay. But my student is going to go to England to 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 study, okay. And then uh, he encouraged me to play, and then I asked him what to play, and then he say, <laughs> "What do you want to play?" I say, "I'm working on Chopin tunes because I want to move my fingers." And then he said, okay, fine, that's the half of the program, right? And then I asked him, you know, what do you want to hear? And then he said, Brahms. So and then I say, I play two Brahms recipe. And then what else? He said, the least. <laughs> so oh. I play the Dante. <laughs> so he makes the program, I didn't. And then he organized the concert. Uh, I just go over there and play. Okay, so <laughs> I, 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 I don't have to thank you. You, thank you, you, but I thank you. Uh, Mr. Chen. <laughs> okay, okay, Mr. Chen. Thank Raymond you very Chen. much. <laughs> thank you, thank you. Okay. Uh, okay, thank you very much. If you have other questions, please feel free to ask. Very complex. Yes. Uh, yes, yes. Actually, you know, because I'm talking and I'm not concentrating. Otherwise, mm -hmm. uh, you know, uh, in my concert, you know, you will hear so many lines, so many change of tonalities, harmonies. Okay, and sometimes the position of the hands are very awkward. It's mm. not fit to the hand, like Beethoven's lay sonatas. It's not uh, written for the pianists. Okay, they just think about the music. They didn't think about the piano. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. But for Chopin and uh, Liszt, it's a completely another story. I hope I answer your question. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so we hope to to have uh, another site. Also, we will ask Chen to 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 have another one uh, <laughs> by the end of the year or next year. Okay. <laughs> okay. Thank All you. Right. Thank you. Okay. Thank you for coming to to the small talk. Thank you.